I'm Richard Zanivi. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, the talk today is going to be about formula indexing search and entry in a project called the Mass Year Project. And I'll explain what that is right now once I get control of my mouse. Okay, so uh, the Mass Year Project is uh, an Alfred Sloan Foundation and MSF funded project um, where our goal is to try and bring mass search to the masses. So slogan aside, the goal there is to make it easier to find, use, manipulate, edit, and reuse mathematical formulas uh, in search and communication. And what you're looking at here on this slide are the four uh, lead investigators in the project. So of course, it's myself. Anurag Agarwal is a math professor at RIT. Uh, C. Lee Giles, some of you may know from Sightseer fame. Uh, he was one of the people who built the Sightseer search engine, which is now Sightseer X. And Doug Ord is uh, at the University of Maryland. He's a very well-known researcher in information retrieval. Uh, just really quickly, before we get into the rest of the talk, I want to introduce my lab. We've done a lot of the work you're going to see. Uh, so this is, you know, this is how lab meetings happen now. So this is our, a screenshot from our Zoom a couple of weeks ago. Um, so just to acknowledge the students here. So from top left, we have Abhishek, myself, and then uh, Matt Longzenkamp, who's our research programmer. Then we have Beiruz Mansuri, Jan Carlos Diaz, Robin Amonoso, and finally Ayush Kumar Shah, who's currently in Nepal, but threatening to finally come to America in the next month or so. Uh, he got admitted to the program uh, just about the time that the COVID shutdown happened, and uh, he decided to stick with it. So I'm grateful for that. So let me give you an overview of the, this basically, we're going to see a, a number of systems, and I'm going to present them mostly in terms of the information that they use, and at a high level, the types of algorithms and processing that they, uh, they utilize. So that'll be the focus. I'm happy to answer questions about more technical details if people have them, but the, the focus here will just be to give a sense of how information flows through these systems. So the first system I'll talk about is Symbol Scraper. It basically is a way to try and avoid doing OCR and PDF documents. Uh, ScanSSD and QDGGA are two systems used to locate and then recognize or parse the structure of uh, formulas. And finally, MathDeck is an interactive uh, graphic search tool that I'll show at the end. Um, there will not be uh, brief discussion sessions. This is, sorry, this slide was copied from another talk. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. So first, let's talk about Symbol Scraper. Um, the citation there for the first time the system appeared. I'm hoping to finally have a paper describing this thing publicly soon. So let's talk about avoiding OCR. So if you have a document that's been written with a modern word processor, so you're using Word or LaTeX or a diagram editor like ChemDraw or your favorite graphics um, program like you know, Microsoft Equation Editor, usually they're going to represent uh, text and graphics using vectors in PDF. And this, these vector representations are basically just instructions to say, draw an object of this type. So whether it's a word, a character, an embedded image, I have this thing I wanna draw, it's of this type, it has these parameters and it, it's in this place. And so there's actually these instructions on how to draw the page. So that's these vectors that we'll be talking about. Now vector graphics, some of you may already know, are when you have a graphics representation that is in terms of these drawing instructions, for objects to render rather than a raster image. So a raster image is like a normal picture you get on your phone or something like that. And in that case, you have an array of pixels, right? So if you actually insert a raster image into a PDF, you don't suddenly get these vector commands I'm talking about. That image will be embedded as an object, but it's just an object saying, draw this picture here. So if you include, um, copy and paste a scanned image from a JPEG or a PNG, for example, that's going to uh, appear as an image of a document and you will need OCR in that case. So uh, I'm working on a, a project in parallel that involves chemistry. So you're gonna see uh, some examples in this talk that involve chemistry as well as math. And the reason for that is twofold. One, it's easier, <laughs> I had it handy, but more importantly, to try and get at the idea that some of these techniques I'm talking about aren't really math specific. And you know, the original goal of the project was to use math as kind of a springboard. So here's a, a paper uh, from chemical literature. If you see this chemical diagram right here that I've highlighted, this is an example of a raster image. So if we zoom in on this, when you magnify in this image, you actually magnify pixels. And so you end up with what you'd expect, in this case, it's a binary image. So you end up with a bunch of halos around characters and noise, you know, and things broken and so on. Okay, so if you have this type of graphic representation, you don't have those vector commands I was talking about. So you would need OCR to get it. However, a lot of modern documents, in this case, the same document, you'll have a lot of diagrams that in fact do have these drawing commands. So in the case of a chemical diagram like this, there would be instructions for each of the letters, all the lines, all the arrows. 
and they would tell you where the objects appear and how they're drawn. So if you have that, it allows you to actually redraw the page. So you'll notice that when we zoom in this time, it's still perfectly clean. And so this is what we've all come to expect when we have a nice, what they call born digital PDF document that somebody's created with the word or tech or something like that. So in a case like this, you don't actually need OCR to get the information needed to get at least the individual symbols of the diagram. So let's talk about how in particular text is represented. This will be pertinent in a second in a PDF file. So it turns out that PDFs actually encode text lines, each of which have what they term words, which are collections of characters. So if you have these vector instructions, you can look for those instructions on where to draw things, how to group characters into words, and what the characters are directly. And this applies to not just raw text, but also graphics. So as we saw in that previous slide, you know, the M's and the E's and so on, those are indicated with these text instructions. So I'm going to give an example uh, of symbol scraper output. We're gonna walk through some uh, examples from math and then we're gonna see some fun properties that I learned about chemical um, PDFs. It'll make graphics analysis easier there. So this is uh, just showing on the left here, output from the uh, about four different systems that are used to try and extract where symbols are on a page. So the thing to notice just at a high level is the bottom right, everything is tightly cropped. That should say symbol scraper, not mass scraper, I apologize. It's a danger of copy and paste from an old paper. But you can see here in this formula, the X the equals the two, the sigma, everything is tightly cropped around the character. So we know exactly where the character is positioned on the page. Now you would think based on what I saw, that would be trivial, right? If, if in fact there are these drawing instructions, all you should have to do is go and get parameters of how to draw the character, and then you would be able to get these boxes around where the characters are. Well, it turns out you can see from the other three tools, the actual instructions that are given in a PDF document don't actually tell you where the character is exactly. What they tell you is where on the writing line the character is and what its attributes are. So it'll tell you if it's italic or if it's bold or if it's two point or 12 point and so on. And so you can estimate the size, but not the exact shape or location. So you can see in these other extractors, you know, sort of PDF minor, high new PDF and PDF box, you get some fairly weird looking behavior. And that's because the, the inferences being used don't actually look at the characters directly. They just look at the instructions saying draw a thing here. And it turns out, as you can see, these instructions on where to draw the characters if misinterpreted, produce boxes that are too big or even inverted around the center of the character and weird stuff like that. So it turns out that to do this thing we see at the bottom right, the symbol scraper, is what you do is you intercept the rendering pipeline. So the way that individual characters are represented are as glyphs. So I learned this because uh, we were struggling with this, couldn't make it work. We eventually talked to someone who used to work in the typography business. And we were talking about PDS and they said, we can't find exactly where these characters are. It's driving us crazy. And he just commented casually, well, the glyphs are of course there in the, the font attributes. And we said, what, say that again. And it turned out that if you just went ahead and looked at the actual individual representations of the characters, you could get their exact shape. And then you could use the parameters for the drawing instructions to figure out where the character is, how it resizes, and then get those exact boxes. Okay, so these underlying glyphs for each character actually represent each symbol in a fixed size cube known as an, an M box. So M is you know, a, an uppercase character and it's a particular size, standard size in font metrics. Okay, and so often in different fonts, these boxes will be a thousand by a thousand pixels or 2048 by 2048 pixels, depending on the type of font you're using. And so each character will be drawn in one of these glyph boxes in a way that kind of fills the box. And the point of that, of course, is if you want high quality rendering, you don't want a lot of the box to be empty, right? You wanna have a very high resolution, high detail representation of the curve and so on, because at this level, it's just a series of, of uh, low level drawing instructions. So it turns out that to do that, an X versus a P versus a plus, well, they appear at different points on the writing line. So if you wanna be able to have drawing instructions that say put character here with these attributes, you need to know where that writing line is. And that's what it's referred to as the origin. So in the case of an X, that's somewhere here roughly at the bottom left of the character because it sits on the writing line. For something like a P that's not true. And so you can see here, one of the reasons we're getting these offsets incorrect is that you have to actually correct, even if you can get the right size, for the location of that origin. So in a P, a P glyph box, the origin is going to be higher than it would be for an X because the base of the P goes below the writing line. And so if you just correct for the origins and do a simple translation, presto, you get these 
perfect bounding boxes. Now, the reason we care about this for our work is we want to be able to try and recognize math formulas in particular without having to perform OCR, but we need to know exactly where those characters are, okay, and how they look. And now that we can intercept the rendering pipeline, we can do that. Nothing in life is perfect. That includes Symbol Scraper. And so it turns out that um, the representation in PDF telling you how to draw the characters, in some cases, we draw some symbols in pieces. So on the right-hand side here, you see this big brace that's drawn with three characters. And so to figure out that you know, these should in fact go together, the PDF doesn't tell you that. So if you're lucky, it might tell you this is a word. But if it doesn't, then you have to figure out that basically these shapes intersect. And you can imagine you can go back to the glyphs and figure out that using a polygon algorithm that those things intersect. So that works in many cases, it's not perfect. And you know, some common symbols like square roots do this all the time. And so you end up having to add some heuristics, but for any character that's actually drawn in isolation, you get it directly. And if you have things like braces that are going to be rendered in a clean document you know, separately, you can get quite far with this, a little bit of processing. So what does this actually look like in the output? So shown on the left-hand side is another chemical um, page from a, a chapter on Suzuki Miura coupling. On the right-hand side is the output of Symbol Scraper. And I just want to show you roughly how this is represented in the output file. So we're going to look at this first text line of a document where the page number and the title is. So here is the representation of the text line. And so this is an XML format. And so just like HTML, there's a start tag and end tag for every attribute, right? So we have a line, and then it contains a number of words, and then here's the end line. Every one of these tags has a bounding box, which just represents the lower left-hand corner and the width and the height of the, the region that we're talking about. And so this line ID is a tighter than shown uh, bounding box around the page number and the title. So the page number is actually represented as a word, right? So it, it turns out that topographers aren't insane. And so if they actually have things like numbers and words and so on, they do group them. So you're not just looking at a bunch of characters on a page. So they organize things by text lines and words. So here's 552 with the bounding box of each character, again, extracted directly from the drawing instructions after intercepting the rendering pipeline. Here's organic, written as a second word. Again, you can see the letters here, the bounding boxes. And then finally, here's reactions. So if we have this, we can find the exact locations of characters and symbols on the page and their appearance without having to do any LCR. And that's beneficial for our later processing here. It's also much faster. If you have to do uh, image processing, it's much more expensive than just reading instructions out of a PDF file, much slower. Uh, just another uh, sort of aside, but a fun thing that I discovered just before the holidays, actually. So in this other project I'm working on, uh, we're trying to look at chemical diagrams as well. Well, again, back to this idea of typographers not being insane. So if you're making the software that draws things like the ChemDraw for chemical diagrams, turns out that there are you know, some sane groupings. So here's a compound, right? So that's palladium and I forget what LN is, but so here's our, our compound. All the characters in that compound appear as one word, right? And then if I just, for time, I'll just go through the others here. So this illustrates that every one of these compounds even in the case of this one with the green, let me show this here, this one's kind of interesting. So there is a line here. Oh, let me back up one more time, sorry. There is a line between the R2 and the BY2. Wow, I'm having trouble today. Sorry, here we go. So there's a line here between the R2 and the BY2. That would be represented as a drawing command as well. But despite this gap, this is still rendered as a single word. So why this is interesting for the purposes of recognition is it means that if you have uh, text units of things like figures and diagrams and so on, if the tool is rendering these things together, you don't actually have to uh, segment them. Now, the reason that matters, as we'll talk about in a moment, is that while the PDF is telling you where all the characters are, it doesn't tell you where the graphics are at all. Okay, so it only, it really only represents how to draw things. And so that brings us to the next subject. So we're able to get all those characters and words. As I mentioned, it's not completely perfect. In some cases, you have to merge characters and there are other special cases. But for the most part, we can now find where the characters are. However, that does not tell us within a PDF document, for example, where a formula begins or ends, either in a text line or what's called displayed when it's offset. So to actually find these locations, we have to do additional analysis because the PDF does not represent that. And what you're seeing on the left is we've used our tool called Scan SSD, short for Scanning Single Shot Detector, but some of you may not, might know. Uh, that basically you know, does a search over the page and locates where these formulas are. After we do that, we then need to recognize the structure or parse it. And what you're seeing here on the right-hand side 
is after we've extracted the diagram, so for example, here's zeta of t k. This is showing the, the region that's been detected. This is showing the symbols that we got from symbol scraper. This is the graph representing the structure of the expression. And this is the rendered LaTeX for the formula. And so what we have is for each of these blue boxes on the left, we have a recognition result on the right representing the content of the formulas. So this, uh, this touches back on what I was talking about a moment ago. So given that we can get all these characters, why can't we just extract formulas? Why doesn't the PDF tell us where things are? Well, the ob most obvious case is where uh, if you've embedded a raster image, so you actually draw a formula, you take a PNG of it or a screenshot and you're looking at a web page and you take a screenshot and you put it in your document. Uh, in that case, you don't have the character information, right? So you would still need to analyze that to get the characters and the structure of it. And PDF files, while theoretically capable, never contain, you know, that I've ever seen, information about where graphics regions are, not tables, not figures, not graphs, not plots, not formulas. So you don't have that information available to you. So we're going to need to be able to find these locations where these formulas and other graphics, if we want to use them, are located. And so this is a, I'll just pause for a quick second. Are there any, any questions at all before I, I start talking about how scan SSD is used to find formulas on a page? Any good questions? People should feel free to uh, post questions in the chat. And I, I'm already formulating a few, but I, I'm, I'm gonna have to put a few, <laughs> put them in the chat. Okay, all fine. Feel free to stop me at any point if you have a question. So we've seen how to get the characters out of a document. Now we want to be able to locate where the formulas are so we can later um, identify them, recognize them, and then index them for search. So what you see here on the left-hand side is an input page from a math a journal article in particular. What we do as our first step in scan SSD is we use what's called a sliding window strategy. So this is a very, very old but often useful technique where the, an input page, in our case, would be rendering at 600 dots per inch. So every inch is 600 by 600 pixels. Um, we can't process that image in a single pass on uh, modern neural networks because you will not have enough data to learn the right correlations unless you do a lot of subsampling. And we don't want to do that because in particular, many of the formulas are a single symbol or very small, and we want to be able to still get them with high accuracy. So instead of subsampling the image down and then running a network, what we do instead is we look for formulas using a fixed size window that we slide across the rows of the image, right? So for example, we might take an original document page and then we extract something like hundred windows, right? That we get just by, for example, overlapping the windows by you know, 25% each time and then trying each individual time to actually do a detection. Now there's uh, Donna has a question here. Is the idea to be able to reconstruct the formulas from the characters in the page? Yes. What we wanna be able to do is say on this page, there are these formulas with this content. Right, so that we can then use that for editing and search and, and other applications. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so this is like the very sort of the baseline thing you want to be able to do. I guess I'm a picturing down the road, you wanted to look for all the documents that had a particular integral formula in them. We're going to get there. Uh, okay, good. All right. <laughs> so, but yes, that, that this is the uh, initial extraction is what they call it, that you need to be able to get the formula information in the database. That makes sense. It's not actually, believe it or not, this is not impossibly hard specifically because we're being given the symbols in many cases. And even when you're not, the thing about typeset images is they don't have as, as complex variation as, for example, a natural scene. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have hard cases, uh, but in many of the modern techniques can actually do fairly well, uh, at least in an average sense of, of processing these types of things. So uh, back to SSD here, we cut up the input page using these sliding windows. What we do at every window as we run the single shot detector, which I'll just describe very briefly here. And this isn't, this isn't mine, this is uh, Wei Lu and his colleagues uh, work from ECCV 2016. So the, the single shot detector, the idea with that model was it's in the family of some, what some of you might know as the faster RCNN models. And the idea is that you have a convolutional neural network that basically tries to score a whole lot of possible places where something might be at the same time. So in our case, for every one of these three windows that you've shown here, and again, those three might represent hundreds, for every window, you're actually gonna evaluate about 21,000 possible locations where a formula might be at the same time. 
So the basic idea with this, the scan shot detector is you process the features in a series of neural layers. And then at the output layer, so at the output, what you have is a fixed set of locations at different resolutions. You basically tile the image with rectangles of different sizes. You know, so you have, you know, the very low resolution where it's large regions and eventually have a high resolution. It's a lot of boxes across the whole image. And what you do is you score all those at once. So the network's actually designed to look at all of those at the same time and then find the best candidates. And in addition to that, the really clever thing with uh, SSD was in addition to scoring those rectangles, the rectangles are allowed to translate and deform a bit so they can get wider and taller and the center of the box is allowed to move. So you're allowed to do this 21,000 times. Now, as you might imagine, if you're looking for things that are roughly rectangular, it works rather well, and it also tends to be quite fast. It's what's called a, a single pass network, and that's why it's called single shot. So what you're seeing in these three examples are um, in each of the windows that have been extracted, SSD has been executed, and it's showing regions that were detected as being likely to be formulas with different confidences, right? So white here indicates high confidence, red indicates low confidence. But, you know, so we have a score for these three formulas. If you look in the background, part of another formula has been lit up, and then these two formulas that are peeking out of the back have also been found in that third panel. Now, if you have these hundreds of detections, of course, you have to somehow then integrate them, right? If you want to be able to go back to the page and say formula is here, you can't do it from the windows. So the windows generate a whole lot of hypotheses, as you can see here. And uh, from these hypotheses, we actually generate some region candidates and associated confidences, as you can see in the back here. So we go from what are potentially thousands of little detections, we, in we integrate them, combine them, and then we end up with a heat map. That heat map then gets thresholded, and we tune that on a training set, so we do that well. And then in the end, you get your detected formulas. So the basic strategy is cut up the page, look a whole lot of, you know, whole lot of little regions, in every one of those regions, evaluate a lot of possible rectangles. And yes, there's some constraints on that if you're curious. Score those, put them together, and then you know, generate a map and integrate them. And that actually works fairly well. So the uh, I don't have it here on the slide, but when we did the initial uh, experiments with this, we we're using a data set known as DTDB that was developed by a group in Japan led by Dr. Suzuki. And we had a with the character level F measure. So the uh, harmonic mean of precision and recall was 93%. It was actually a little higher than that. So recall was something like 96 point something percent and um, the precision was 92. That was at the character level. So one of the things that this model sometimes doesn't do well that we don't love, but it's not terrible, is it will split formulas that you can see it here. So there's a large horizontal gap between uh, this definition of the formula on the left and then some conditions on the right. When you have large gaps like that, if the algorithm hasn't seen a lot of examples of that type, or you don't have a way to handle the stitching across the different windows, you can end up with some breaking. Now, the good news from a search perspective, though, is because the character level detection rate is so high, as long as we don't break things up into regions that are too big or don't merge them too often, we can still, in search, uh, our formula search mechanisms, still catch a lot of things. And so it turns out that as a first cut, it works quite well. Okay. So we've been able to get a PDF page and we can get characters and we now have a technique to find where our formulas are. And so the logical thing to do if you wanna start moving towards finally having our formulas structure is to take the page and run symbol scraper and, and scan SSD at the same time. And so on the left, what you're seeing, there's again, green boxes representing where characters have been detected, right? Characters and lines and, and so on, whatever it is that we can capture out of the vector instructions. And on the right-hand side, we have the regions that have been detected by scan SSD using the process we just saw on the previous slide. Shockingly, <laughs> the way we get the characters belonging to a formula is just to take the intersections of the rectangles, right? So for example, you look at this formula and we say, well, what symbols from the symbol scraper output are in this region? We just find where they are. And then the final output looks like this, right? And so here's our, our example again of zeta te. Here's the um, exponentiation formula we've been looking at and so on. So at this point, uh, our formula representation is we have these sets of PDF symbols with associated page regions. Um, but if we want to actually get uh, structure, so whether it's LaTeX, smiles for chemical diagrams, et cetera, we're going to need to recognize the content. So right now, we, it might look like we're done, but we're not. We don't actually know that this is a fraction. We don't know what this uh, EXP is to the right of the equals or any of that. So we then have to do the parsing stage to actually um, get that out. 
Now, before I talk about that, I want to say a little bit about graphics representations, focusing on math, but also talking more broadly. Again, there's this idea that math here, while I'm excited about it, is hopefully sort of a, a first step towards doing these types of things with other notations as well. So graphics can be naturally represented by using graphs, uh, capture sort of two main properties of interest. So the first is the visual syntax, basically the appearance. And so you can see here what we have what's called a symbol layout tree. So this is the formula x squared equals four, okay, represented as a tree. And of course, in a symbol layout tree, all we're representing is where symbols appear on writing lines and then spatial relationships like subscripts and superscripts and you know being above or below a line and a fraction and that kind of thing. So this representation just tells you how to draw the thing. It doesn't tell you what it means, right? You can't evaluate the formula directly from this. You can think of an SLT as being roughly equivalent to LaTeX without the formatting commands. Right, that's, that's what an SLT gives you. And then the second type of representation we want for math or other graphics is, of course, the semantics. What is it, the information that's supposed to be represented by the formula or by the chemical diagram, or whatever. In the case of a mathematical formulas, it's the sequence of operations on values, right? Variables, constants, and so on. And so this same formula, x squared equals four, if, you know, thinking like a compiler writer for a moment, you say, well, if I had a piece of code that said x caret two uh, equals four, well, the way that would get constructed as a structure inside the compiler is, well, I have this operation of squaring x to the two, and then this relation saying that that is equal to four. So this actually represents the hierarchy of operations shown in the formula. Okay, so this is the semantics or the encoded information. Semantics is in quotes because uh, <laughs> technically speaking, this is the syntax of the operations. This does not necessarily tell you, for example, that this is uh, exponentiation and not some other operation. So you can sometimes in math use a superscript as an index location, right? So you, you that this gets into a sort of a complex semantic argument uh, about linguistics, but basically some people would tell you that's mathematical syntax and not mathematical semantics, thus semantics in quotes. Okay, so there's some other quick examples of other domains where you can do the same visual syntax and encoded information breakdown. So there's chemical diagrams, Right, so undirected graphs are of course a very natural way to represent chemical diagrams. And then if you want to represent the actual compound, you might use something like smiles. Uh, for tables, you know, appearance, you can describe tables in terms of the rows and cells they contain and which cells are headers and which cells are data values. That's the appearance. The indexing structure then gets at, when you have a particular table and it says algorithm F measure number, well, that's an actual, to interpret that, that's an indexing structure. Right? You have two variables with two values that then map to one value. Right? It's basically a dictionary with one or more dimensions. Okay, so back to this idea of recognizing structures. So we talked about what structures we might be after. For this work, we're currently just going to worry about the visual appearance, but you, know, you can from any notation from there map to uh, semantics if you have the right constraints. So back to doing visual stuff, and we're using the example of chemistry again. So here's our raster graphics in the bottom. So this is an image somebody's copy and paste in the document. And then this is a chemical diagram that was drawn with some program that outputs drawing instructions that appear in a PDF. So whether you have either of these representations, eventually you want to get this to some encoding. And so if you were doing chemical stuff, that would be smiles. For math, it might be LaTeX or something equivalent to a symbol layout tree. Now, there are a number of challenges with doing this. So the first is, in this case, we have two different input types. Right? In one case, we know all the primitives, like all the characters, all the lines, it's all given. All we gotta do is find out how they're connected. It's very different than being given a raw image where now we actually have to figure out those primitives, you know, where are the lines, where are the characters before being able to construct a graph. There's also issues with noise and it never fails to amaze me and amuse me. Uh, so at least I can definitely, I'm sure, relate to this. Every time we talk in computer science about using encodings to remove noise, people find a way to ruin it. Uh, so what we have here on the bottom left, we talked before about how if you have a, an image and you, you, know, you just copy and paste it and then you compress it or, you know, uh, you know, do, you know, just do a bad capture, you end up with noise in the image. So shown in the pink circle, here's some schmutz that we don't really want. But this is, this, is, this is true. This is real. This is from an example from the other group I'm working with. Uh, so if you see this pink circle here, this is actually two little triangles that I believe were drawn by accident when somebody was trying to create this diagram. So if you just assume that everything in this region was part of the chemical diagram, you'd be wrong. This is not an edge, this is an error. Okay, and so noise, noise happens in patterns wherever 
<laughs> we try to use it no matter how well encoded the document is. That's been one, one lesson I'm like. If we're going to do the raster diagrams, we're going to have to do OCR, right? But we'd like to do that in context of getting the diagram structure. And eventually, we want to get the graph structure. So we're going to have these different input types we have to handle. There's noise, even in the case where, you know, in theory, it's clean, perfect vector input. Uh, we need to run OCR if we don't have the information of the drawing instructions, and then we have to identify the graph structure. So I'm going to show uh, there are a number of different ways to do this. And for those who are really curious, there's a whole lot of encoder decoder techniques being used right now. So it feels like ever since they did the automatic captioning uh, of, um, of figures, uh, everybody is using that model. We're going to be using something slightly different, partly because we have more information when those characters are available. So we're going to take a slightly different approach. So this is what's called the Query Driven Global Graph Attention Parser. Michelle Madavi published this last year at a CBPR workshop on documents. Um, so the way this technique works is it's a bit, bit old school in this way. It works from what's called connect components. These are black blobs. So if you look at this formula, G sub i you know, equal to the partial square root over z, the inputs to the parsing algorithm are going to be the connected black regions in the image, right? So the base of the i, the g, the dot, the e2 equals separately. Each one of the black blobs will be one input. And uh, the motivation for this is if you're using typeset documents, especially if by and large, like for the Massier project, they're born digital. Um, even if you rendered those pages, uh, the connected components tend to be very cleanly separated and connected components almost never come from multiple characters by design, right? You want to typeset your document so it's easy to see the characters apart. So by doing that, you can simplify processing rather than having to work from raw pixels. And it also gives us an easy way to cheat and to support either character level or raw pixel level inputs. So for the raw pixels, we'll use the, you know, just the uh, connect components. If you actually tell me this is an eye, the algorithm is designed so I can cheat and treat my connected component as both of the pieces of the eye at once. So we're going to recognize the formula structure as the visual structure of this formula in this example. So we're going to recognize GI equals partial squared over Z. We're not going to interpret its operator tree. We're not going to tell you what it means. We will tell you how symbols are placed on writing lines. So the way the algorithm starts is it takes all of the connect components. Remember, if we actually work from the connect components, we didn't assume we knew the characters, the I would be broken up into two pieces. You can see that here. And the equals will be broken up into two pieces as well. So from this, you then create a complete graph. So for every pair of connect components, we create an edge in both directions. And so you can see that here, here's an adjacency matrix. Here's the G dot of the I, base of the I, two lines of the equals, the partial, the fraction line, the two and the Z, okay? And so we, adjacency matrix, we just lay these out row wise and column wise. The main diagonal is where our symbols are represented. So we can represent symbol classes there for the individual components. And then everything off the diagonal or edges in the two different directions. So for example, from G to I, uh, sorry, from G to the dot of the I, there's an edge going forward and then there's a, an edge in the opposite direction from the dot to the G. Okay, so it's a bi-directional direct graph. So to simplify processing and to increase accuracy by simplifying the recognition problem, the next thing we do is we apply some pruning on the edges we're actually going to use for analysis. And so uh, a simple thing that you can do, there are other techniques that you can apply, but this algorithm uses the line of sight constraint. The line of sight constraint simply says that if from the center of one connect component, I can't draw a straight line to another connect component, then it's excluded from the graph. So a good example here is the two and the exponent and the G. If you look from roughly the center of the G and try to draw a line to this two, it goes through possibly the I, definitely the equals and the partial. And so what happens is we remove that edge. And you can see that here, the G to the two, that's now gray. Only the yellow cells are the ones we're going to evaluate. So we've gone from having a complete graph, you know, roughly N squared edges, to something that's not quite linear, but a heck of a lot smaller. So once we've done this, uh, we then use a convolutional neural network. It's uh, a feed work model, a feed forward uh, model based on ResNet for the feature extraction. And then basically, um, without getting into details right now, but we have a cheat where we can line up or stack each of the connect components based on where they appear in space and just make them a stack of inputs uh, to the network. And so it can very quickly do uh, three problems at once. So it classifies each of the connect components as an individual symbol. It then tries to recognize relations, spatial relationships between all the connect components for the yellow cells in the graph, shown in blue. 
and then to also identify which of these um, connect components might be merged into a symbol. So, you know, the dot of the I and, and uh, putting that with the base and equals and so on. So this is done in one pass. So this is an example of what they call multitask learning. Basically, you have a cost function, an objective function that you use to train this end-to-end -end trainable feed neural network, pre-forward neural network, to um, uh, look at the errors it makes in symbol classification, relation classification, and symbol detection all in one go. So it's recognized in one pass. And then when you're during training, you would compute an error function over these three elements based on cross entropy for those who are curious. And then you update the weights and then you do that in an iterative setting. So in the execution setting though, you have your weights set and you just classify all these edges in the main diagonal. And then once that's done, we move to creating a new line of sight graph that is based on detected symbols. So the detected symbols come out of looking at the symbol detection map. And so for example, here, you know, it's an example, so of course it works perfectly. And we have two lines of equals, and we've actually done a binary classification here to say merge or split at every one of these purple locations. And it turns out that one of the edges between the two lines, we said merge. And so this will now become a single symbol, new, a single node in the graph. Same with the base of the eye and the dot of the eye, that'll be merged into a single unit as well. The way that we deal with combining the relationship and symbol classification confidences is for now, we just average them. Right, so if I actually put the two lines of the equals together, then the probability of this being an equals comes from the average. Right, and then we can perform classification there if we wanted, but we don't actually need to in most cases. So once this is put together, uh, the final step is then to prune the remaining edges. Right, so just to quickly review, we went from a complete graph of connect components to a filtered graph using this line of sight constraint, classifying all of the connect components, all of the relationships, and all possible merges between components at once. Then, based on the symbols that we've said should go together, or sorry, components that should be symbols, we merge things into nodes. We use some averaging to keep these probabilities. Then, in the final step, what we do is we extract a directed spanning tree. And that directed spanning tree corresponds to a symbol layout tree. Right? So the algorithm that we use for this is called Edmund's arborescence algorithm. Some of you may know it. It is a, a standard dynamic programming uh, approach for breaking cycles in weighted graphs to extract a directed tree. And so this tends to work very well in practice. It tends to be in practice, well, it's theoretically uh, cubic. In practice, it's often very fast. Our input sizes aren't very large, that's partly why. And so you can see the final output here is we have G sub i to the right is an equals, to the right of the equals is a fraction line, above that is partial, below it is a z, and there's a superscript. So using this single sort of pass, we go from blobs on a page and everything might be related to only some things might be related to what are they and how are they structured, restructuring to find symbols, and then finally, based on the edges that remain at this point, extracting the final uh, layout tree from the adjacency matrix. And you can see here that like any, any good tree, you have n symbols in the end and n minus one edges, right? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, symbols and one, two, three, four, five, six edges of the final tree. Now, I mentioned that we want to be able to deal with different inputs. So the example I've given here is actually when we work from a raw image and then we extract the connect components and do the processing. Now, if all the symbols are known, we can actually cheat, right? So we can actually put the symbols instead of the components here in the input, and we can just ignore the uh, symbol segmentation and symbol class information here and just get the relationships out in the final graph. A more common situation though might be you have a formula that's you know, uh, drawn with vector instructions most of the time and sometimes not. Um, in that case, what you can do is apply constraints in constructing the symbol graph and then finally extracting the final tree based on what you know. So for example, if the PDF file tells you that G equals in the fraction line or horizontally adjacent, well, we can actually just force those edges to be selected here in the final step. Right? So depending on the amount of information we have, we can very easily uh, constrain the recognition to make it more accurate. Okay, uh, so I have one more thing to show. Are there any quick questions before I, I move on here? I just put one in the chat. Okay. Um, do we use a uh, high level? No, so we actually, that's our own network built in uh, PyTorch. The ResNet model, I believe, came from an existing library, but the actual architecture of the network is wrong. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's not it's not called this library and, and out it goes. No, we had we had to build it ourselves. 
much. But thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, Donna was asking earlier, so hopefully this is eventually for doing something with the math, right? And so this is where I'll show you some of the stuff we can do with the math if it's been extracted and indexed. Um, so this is a system you're looking at here known as MathDeck. Uh, this is an interactive math search interface. Uh, we actually have a demo at CHI this year where we'll be presenting this in May. Uh, and I won't be able to talk to, about it a lot here, but we've also done a lot of work on search algorithms for formulas in my lab. And we actually have a SIG IR full paper appearing um, in the middle of the summer as well on using learning to rank techniques with math formula retrieval. So we've been, we've been looking at everything from getting the math off the page to eventually using it for search. And in addition, uh, creating formula editors in these search engines that involve formulas so that they're easier to use. So math search, <laughs> this will be <laughs> crash, crash, crash course. Um, so some of the reasons or the information needs that you might try to address while searching for things that are mathematical include defining notation, so like symbol names and concepts associated with a formula, technical information, so maybe you want to find papers that give you proofs or describe cost functions, examples or applications of a particular formula, proofs, and resources, so tutorials, videos, and so on. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, formula entry and editing. You know, it would be nice to have things like formula autocomplete to make it easier to finish uh, formula editing, refining formulas so you don't have to recreate them, and then finally, browsing and discovery, right, which is kind of the other. So <laughs> supporting settings where you just kind of want to learn about math stuff and you can let your mind wander about math things, right? So finding similar formulas, proofs and resources related to these things that aren't quite what you were looking at, and then the use of techniques across discipline and so on. So that, that ties to discovery. So let's look at using interactive graph search. So MathDeck incorporates math formulas in a web search interface, basically. And it's designed with non-experts in mind. By non-experts, I mean mathematical non-experts. Uh, because we're dealing with non-experts, we've done a lot of work to try and make it possible to enter formulas using typing, drawing, and images all in one ecosystem and, and fairly flexibly. And uh, the name of the application comes from this deck of cards that we show in the interface that contains reusable formulas, names, concepts, and Wikipedia excerpts. So what you're seeing on the left here is an example of one of these cards that you saw earlier in the interface, here at the bottom of this application. And so if you actually click on this little arrow here for Pythagorean theorem, what happens is the card expands, and this is the beginning of a Wikipedia article. Right, so here's a link to the article. This is a match because it was in response to the search. And this is what we call a chip. This is actually a reusable uh, formula that has LaTeX associated with it. So you can use this for editing, you can use it for search, you can use it to save for later. You can even download it as an image and then bring it back at a later time if you want to use it in the application. So I'm going to show you, <laughs> shamelessly here, uh, the preview for our Kai demo. And then I'll show you a, a longer description of how MathDeck is used uh, for formula entry and search. So this is math tech yeah. is a mathware search interface designed to bring math to the masses. Both novice and expert users can benefit from math text structure operations that allow users to change render formulas without knowing LaTeX. Math deck encourages building formulas in small reusable pieces to help reduce the cognitive load required to build large formulas. As users enter formulas, the interface also recommends related concepts in the form of formula entity cards that the user can choose to explore at their discretion. Okay, and so that's kind of quick. So I'll just show a few of the features again. As Jan Carlos was mentioning there, the system's designed so that you have the chips in these tabs so that you can work, save, and operate from formulas in pieces. So you don't, you're not working with a single formula and you're not working with formulas that have to be large. As you saw, you're able to glue things together uh, both in the interface and over in this text panel. Okay, and you can enter, we actually have it so that you can enter LaTeX. And by the way, it's not just single symbols. You can put you can replace selected sub-expressions with entire LaTeX strings, okay? So it's quite flexible. We'll see some examples of this. What we're trying, the point of all this, by the way, is yeah, nominally is to make a better format here for LaTeX, but the real motivation is you wanna make it easy for non-experts to make and reuse formulas so that they can search for things, right? You see a formula they don't know, okay, well, maybe they could just put it up here and be able to look at the cards, the bottom, to eventually figure out what it's called or what it's for. Like that's, that's the type of ecosystem that we're trying to create. So I will show you, not this whole thing, but this is a more, uh, a slightly more casual walk through some of the features of the interface, including the search and the formula editing. So I'm just gonna jog a minute ahead because I don't wanna 
or even all the details of this one. So I think I want 51 seconds and not that. There we go. Okay, so here we go. So three main design goals. We want a flexible combination of LaTeX entry and manipulating rendered formulas. As noted in the last slide, for very simple LaTeX strings, it's still easy for everyone to type certain formulas. So we want to allow that, but we also want the benefit of being able to modify the rendered formula. We also want to reduce complexity by building up from smaller pieces and allow formula information to be discovered, annotated, and saved. So for editing, we have a LaTeX string panel that shows the tech for the formula at all times on the right-hand side. And then the rendered formula that appears on this formula canvas can be manipulated directly through insertion, replacement, and deletion operations. So let's look at an example of inserting a formula in a rendered formula directly. So here's the Pythagorean theorem incomplete. And so we can actually just insert the two on the C for C squared directly by clicking on a button and then entering a LaTeX string. We can also replace sub-expressions on the canvas. So in this example, we take the Pythagorean theorem again, and we're going to replace a plus b equals c by x plus y equals z. And notice that the exponents aren't selected, but we've edited the selected tech, and the formula is correctly updated on the canvas and this tech panel on the right-hand side. So we can build from smaller pieces. So have you know, multiple formulas and small bits, and then put them together using the formula chips you've just seen that can also be downloaded, and canvas tabs that allow multiple formulas to be edited at once. So here's an example of downloading a chip. So once we have our formula here, we can just download it into a JPEG file, which can then be dragged directly back onto the canvas and turned back into a chip. And all the information for the chip is stored in the JPEG. There's no OCR or anything like that needed for this. So using the tabs, uh, we can start combining formulas. So here we have two formulas in our tabs, convert one of them to a chip. And now we're going to drag that chip over to the tech panel and just add it to the expression directly. You can see the tech panel and the rendered formula both get up. One thing I'll just pause to note here is you actually, those blue dots you keep seeing appear around symbols. Yes, you can drop the chips in those blue dots as well. We just, for time, we weren't able to go straight in this demo. So you can do it visually or you can do it using words. So the deck at the bottom of the application uh, contains three views. So one is for these wiki cards that we've seen that have formulas in their names and some hidden descriptions. And then formulas that we've created or created in a separate tab that we can see and access at any time. And we can favorite some of those formulas as well. Then the third view has a symbol palette that contains symbols and expressions, all in chips that we can use as we need. Here's an example of searching uh, wiki cards by formula. So we have a current formula on the canvas we just created. We click on cards. And now you can see that there's a bunch of formulas that have similar structures and symbols that can be seen. And this is expanding a card for the law of cosines to show that we can view more information about formulas if we want to. We can also search wiki cards by concept name. So these titles in the cards can be searched directly. So if we were looking at the Eisenstein triple and deciding to find other things that involve Eisenstein. And so we start typing and interactively filtering the cards based on the titles in the cards. So in conclusion. OK, so in conclusion, you, you already know what the conclusion is. So I guess we, we, we did the design things that we talked about. So um, I'll, I'll leave this there for now. In case you're wondering, we do have a live version of this online. Uh, it's a little out of date, though. So if you're really curious about this, you want to wait a couple of weeks and then before the Kai demo, we'll actually have this and some additional operations that involve handwriting recognition uh, available. For, there's a handwriting recognition now, but it's for a better one. So um, that's the end of the main part of my talk. So I want to thank uh, Lisa for the invitation and Donna for helping get this all set up. I want to point out again that this is collaborative work with Honor Agarwal, C.B. Giles, and Doug Ord, and the students of the Mass Year Project. Um, I want to acknowledge um, the Sloan Foundation as separate funding, and thank you all very much for your time.